All right, we at uh, Ecumenical Women are here with uh, two amazing delegates to the Commission on the Status of Women. We have on the left Jennifer Bailey, from the, a dele delegate from the National Council of Churches and Church Women United. And on the right we have Dr. Fulata Moyo from the World Council of Churches, uh, who is responsible for their work in women in church and society. Um, and so we just wanted to have a little brief sort of uh, intergenerational conversation between you two, um, specifically about uh, addressing how some advoc advocacy groups have uh, sort of corrupted uh, sacred scriptures in their work here at the UN. Um, so just please have a free-flowing conversation. Yeah, one of the things that really strikes me, I'm a seminary student at Vanderbilt Divinity School in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's my first real time engaging religion sort of mm -hmm. academically, right? And previously, my only education had come through my Sunday school, which was great. But what's been interesting for me being here is that I find people taking the biblical text mm -hmm. out of its context, mm -hmm. right? So you have people quoting the household codes, right? Or, you know, wives obey your husbands without saying that second part, which says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So I, I've continually seen here, and even in my broader church life, the way in which people kind of pick and choose what they want to take out of our sacred text in order to advance their own agendas. So, um, so what has been your response to that? To try to speak out, right, or to try to raise that question at Bible study, or even when I'm preaching at my home church, you know, trying to bring up themes um, of justice, right, that speak to or counteract some of the things that we see going on in churches across the country. Um, actually, that, that's an interesting uh, really uh, issue regarding how uh, over generations the sacred texts have been manipulated mm -hmm. to back up certain biases and uh, certain uh, abuses to justify injustice, especially. I mean, if you know the history of slavery, mm -hmm. actually, it was backed up by certain exactly. reading of uh, scriptures uh, that we God has has really like uh, created us in different as different and therefore that should be respected. Here at the UN, especially during the Commission on the Status of Women, so many times you hear particular readings of sacred text mm -hmm. to justify. Uh, the denial of uh, human rights mm. uh, from women, you know, like uh, when it comes to uh, women's right, for ex example, for uh, th that they also deserve health, uh, yeah. to access health for their own bodies and in in the category of what the UN would call sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time this, the sacred text is a particular reading of it that uh, has been used. I come from uh, a context where uh, as an African woman theologian, because my background is also in theology, we uh, have learned to use the contextual Bible uh, study yeah. methodology to read text for liberation, but, but to use the particular reading of the biblical text, especially, or even even the other sacred scriptures, mm -hmm. for affirmation of women's human rights. Yeah, and. Mm -hmm. I found that like you can read even the most difficult texts that some biblical scholars have referred to as texts of terror. Yeah. Like Judges 19, for mm. example. Uh, where? What? what uh, can you tell us talk a little bit more about that particular Bible passage? Okay. Uh, Judges 19 actually is a story about a, a Levite man who uh, has a so-called concubine. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting story, but very sad story, and very, it makes you very angry when you read it, because this man apparently insisted in uh, taking this uh, concubine away from 
her family. She had left him and went back to her family and then he insisted. And then afterwards, really, the parents, the father, accepted that he could take her. And then he had to, uh, it was dark, so he had to spend a night in, in a certain city. Mm -hmm. And in that city where he spent the night, the men of the city wanted to have sexual relations with the man, actually according to the biblical text, yeah. that biblical text. And the host decided that he, he would protect the man as his guest, mm. but he would send out the, the concubine and to, to have the men do with her whatever they wanted. And this girl is raped, and he, uh, they rape her and leave her at the doorstep. In the morning, the Levite finds her there, picks her up, she's dead, picks her up and goes and then cuts her body into 12 pieces and throws it into the 12. So it's, it's a text that you don't find in any liturgical calendars of the churches. But when you read it using uh, contextual Bible study methodology, then you have to wrestle with the fact that this is an injustice. Yeah. This is sexual abuse. This is it's really sexual abuse that should not even be accepted. Yeah. And, uh, and you have to wrestle with the question of who, uh, according to this host, the woman was not a guest to protect. And who is whose bodies are worth protecting? Precisely. What was so interesting is I got to do a contextual Bible study here for the first time with mm. a delegation of young women from around the world, and we looked at the story of the woman who anointed Jesus, mm. and it was fascinating for me because every time that I've read that text, I never notice that the woman never opens her mouth to speak. No. But what was really profound about studying the text across these different national contexts and backgrounds is that. Um, people really pulled out that even though she didn't open her mouth, the very active resistance of ignoring the men in the space was her voice mm -hmm. because she pushed through to Jesus and anointed his head, not his feet. The text tells us in Mark, which yeah. is also an interesting reading, right? Mm -hmm. Often we, we assume that women are supposed to be submissive, so we imagine women at the feet of Jesus, mm -hmm. and there are stories of that. No. But this woman, she anointed his head. Yes. And so that's just such a profound moment for me. And I think, especially for me coming from a historically African-American congregation, mm -hmm. it is so painful for me to hear men in ministry make these arguments about women's submission when the same texts were literally used against my great 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 grandmother mm -hmm. to justify her enslavement and his enslave and my grandfather's yeah. great grandfather's enslavement and so I think we forget that part of our history and the, what we need to talk about is the power dynamics that go into reading our text and how we preach it out there. In the so world. how do you read the text? I think I think the question that Justin uh, Dustin said asked um, it's very interesting that actually these people the people who use the the sacred text to justify certain stereotypes that discriminate against women mm -hmm. have a particular way of reading. Yeah. But you know, like we can choose to you? read the biblical text mm -hmm. in a way that it bring it affirms the human rights of women. Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. Because the biblical text on its own does not demand or does not like specify that you read me this way. Exactly. I mean, right? it does. Amen. Our churches always tell us this is. The, there are certain denominations who will tell you this is the only way to read this text, and no. that's not true. No, it, whatever method of reading you choose, it is a human construction. Mm, yeah. And the, you choose which which an act of interpretation says. when you read, right? Mm -hmm. And we when we interpret. I bring all of my baggage from being, you know, a girl from the south side of Chicago. Precisely. So when I read about a story about rape, I think about, or violence in the text, I think about the gang warfare that's happening in mm -hmm. my hometown mm -hmm. right now. And I bring that to my experience of the text, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think one thing that we as a ecumenical body need to do better about is validating and saying, no matter where you come from or how you interpret that text from your own person, it's important to give voice to those who are marginalized. Yes. One question I often have begun asking myself is whose voice isn't heard in a particular mm. biblical passage, mm. right? So the woman who anointed Jesus, her voice 
her voice was never heard in that text. And her name. We and don't her name know. wasn't named. <laughs> right, right. All right, well, uh, Fulata and Jennifer, thank you both so much yeah, for having this conversation. I think it was really informative, and um, I hope everyone that uh, is watching, I'm sure they're going to all learn a lot from uh, your conversation. So thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Thank you.